In this video, I will be discussing first-line therapy for HER2 negative tumors, and as you'll see, in particularly for pdl one positive gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma, looking at immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1 therapies to be specific. In the recent series of videos, we've been talking about the stage four setting or locally advanced unresectable for whatever reason. Um, when we discuss the importance of staging at the time of diagnosis, this dictates treatment. And so we've been in this category of palliative therapies in general. We've looked at this mind map of how one thinks about treatment after being diagnosed with this situation and going through different lines of therapies in columns and, and focusing now on first line therapy, we spoke about how we categorize patients into different biomarker groups at the time of diagnosis, because again, this dictates therapy. In the previous video, we addressed HER2 positive tumors, and now we're going to be talking about HER2 negative tumors and specifically PDL1 positive tumors. In the videos on the immune system, which I encourage you to go back to, we introduced the concept of an innate immune arm of the immune system and acquired immunity. And with this presentation and talking about PD-1 therapies, checkpoint inhibitors, we're really talking about the protagonist of the story, which is the T cell, the cytotoxic T cell, or CD8 positive cells. In those series of videos, we talked about the cancer immunity cycle, which briefly talks about cancer cells releasing cancer-specific antigens that travel to nearby lymph nodes where priming and activation of T cells with antigen-presenting cells occurs, and then these T cells uh, proceed through the bloodstream to areas wherever the cancer is and kill them. We also talked about in red here at each step the ways that cancer can evade the immune system and then we also talked about in the green steps, different strategies that we have to try and re-harness that immune system and overcome each of those inhibitory steps. In gastroesophageal cancer, the current therapies that are approved from an immunotherapy standpoint are immune checkpoint inhibitors, namely anti-PD-1 therapies, which we'll talk about. Uh, Anti-PD-1 therapies can work um, at the setting or step of priming and activation in the lymph nodes, referred to being a central immune suppressive checkpoint, but mostly is immune checkpoints with PD-1 therapies work peripherally um, where the cancer actually resides. I'll show you on the next slide. We will allude to the other type of checkpoint inhibitor that commercially available, at least in other tumor types, CTLA-4 antibodies, namely ipilimumab, and a study that looked at that um, in gastroesophageal cancer. Here we just review um, what we showed in the immunotherapy series, that cancer cells express their cancer-specific antigens through uh, MHC molecules, class one molecules, and patrolling T cells, if they recognize that as being abnormal, this cell would be activated to kill the cancer cell. However, cancer cells have a mechanism um, to express PDL1 protein that binds to PD1 protein, which is on the T cell, and effectively turns this T cell off. And so the way that immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, work or to, towards PD1 or towards PDL1 is that they bind to those receptors and block the PDL1 PD1 interaction, and that therefore releases the T cell to go on and kill the cancer cell. There are a number of PD1 antibodies. Uh, available and the list continues to grow. Um, in my mind, they're all relatively interchangeable. They're just from different companies. Different studies have been done with each of these. Some of the first ones, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, are already approved for gastroesophageal cancer, as I'll show you. But I will also show you that there have been studies that um, have had positive large phase three studies. Um, and so maybe just a matter of time before more of these become available. Uh, regardless, uh, we talked about how uh, we have a biomarker that helps to predict who will benefit from these therapies, and we're going to go through that uh, extensively with some of the data. But remember, to evaluate this biomarker, it is evaluating the expression of the protein by immunostochemistry, and these are four examples of different expression levels and what it would look like uh, to the pathologist. We've talked about the Cancer Genome Atlas, the TCGA, which 
looked at a whole bunch of uh, tumors with gastroesophageal cancer and did a lot of molecular profiling, gene sequencing, protein analysis, and clustered them into like groups. And there were four main categories. And of those four main categories, I'll show you on the next slide, some of those categories have really high expression generally, and others generally have relatively low expression. That's shown here, this TCGA uh, figure, which along the anatomy of the esophagus and stomach, you can see by category color-coded the incidence of each of these categories along the tube. And so squamous cell esophagus are quite different in, in cause of the cancer and also the biology of the cancer and also differences in their sensitivity, different treatments, and in my mind are a different cancer. But the other four are adenocarcinomas, and you can see their makeup. So the chromosomal and stable being a very common, the most common subtype, and then the genomically stable, or also referred to as the diffuse type, um, is sort of the next common one. And then Epstein-Barr virus positive, EBV positive, which is related to the viral infection, um, and the microsatellite stability related to deficient mismatch repair, or you can see their incidences here. So the first uh, subgroup that I'll highlight, because it is the most sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors, as I'll show you, is the microsatellite instability deficient mismatch repair. And we had a dedicated video about deficient mismatch repair, and I encourage you to go back and look at that, one of the first videos we did to understand the biology of, about that cancer in more detail. Um, but you can see the incidence of it is relatively infrequent. And I want to point out again that these incidences that are shown here are based on samples that were stage one to stage three, so earlier stage cancers. It turns out that in the stage four setting, these incidences are slightly different. And in fact, MSI high tumors make up uh, a relatively small subgroup of gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas that are stage four, about two to three percent. Um, it's more common in gastric compared to the G-junction and esophagus, as you can see even here that um, the MSI high tumors in blue are more common in the fundus body, antrum, and pylorus compared to the upper G junction and, and into the esophagus. It's important to understand that MSI high tumors, uh, as I mentioned, are directly related as a consequence of deficient mismatch repair proteins. And so therefore, MSI high tumors have high tumor mutation burden. There's a lot of mutations. And that's shown here in green. All the green aberrations that you're seeing in different genes are in MSI high tumors. You can see that it's more common compared to in the other subgroups. It's hypermutated. And in addition to that, MSI high tumors tend to have really high PDL1 expression. And, and I'll show you evidence of that in the upcoming slide. So what other uh, subgroups might uh, be sensitive to immunotherapy. Epstein-Barr virus uh, associated EBV positive tumors tend to have a lot of pdl one overexpression and, and some reports have shown that they tend to be more sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors. You can see though that it's relatively uncommon and in the stage four setting, it's really not that common. Uh, when we talk about doing molecular profiling, Many centers don't check specifically for Epstein-Barr virus because it is uh, a specific test that's different than the immunostochemistry test that we've been talking about, and it's not on a next-generation sequencing panel. And so you'd have to do a special in situ hybridization test. And so because it tends to have really high pdl one expression, we, we sort of capture it indirectly by doing pdl one immunostochemistry. If you have a really high EBV positive pdl one expressor, you're, you're going to give them a checkpoint inhibitor. Whether or not you know it's Epstein-Barr virus or not is not really relevant. It's sort of redundant. And this will come up again uh, when we're talking about the biomarkers in the upcoming slides. So what about the other remaining two groups, the chromosomal unstable and the genomically stable, which are the two most common uh, subgroups of the TCGA? Uh, some of those may have really high PDL1 expression, and those are the ones that may still derive benefit. So, PDL1 positive tumors can cross any one of the four TCGA subgroups. They tend to be much higher in incidence PDL1 positivity in the MSI high tumors and the BV positive tumors. And 
likely why these checkpoint inhibitors work better there. But that said, when you have the right patient who has the right biomarker profile, they still have a good chance of driving benefit from PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, um, it, even if they're, say, genomically stable or chromosomal stable. We show here the background of what one might expect from median overall survival with best supportive care, no therapy historically, which plotted on the, on the x-axis is the median overall survival in months, which was not very good. But with the introduction of various chemotherapy uh, regimens, two drug in green, three drug in orange, with the legend below, you can see that the median survival approaches around uh, a year um, with chemotherapy only. We also, in the most recent video, talked about the first targeted therapy that was studied and, and became standard of care for this cancer, and that was HER2-positive cancers getting trastuzumab therapy. And we talked about the TOGA study. And so mapping the TOGA study on this uh, graph, we can see here the performance of the control arm compared to the performance of the arm that got trastuzumab, uh, noted here in light purple. And something we also noted and will become relevant here in the PDL1 story is that patients were eligible for that TOGA study based on whether they had gene copy number increased by fish or they had um, high expression of, of HER2 3 plus. And so basically they were eligible with any immunostem chemistry expression level um, as long as fish was positive or immunostochemistry 3 plus, irrespective of what the fish level was. And that said, when looking at subgroups, as shown here, excluding the patients that were really low expressors, even though they had gene copy number increased, you can see that their benefit was not evident. You hear and see in light purple that actually the median overall survival absolute level was lower than the control arm. And all of the benefits seemed to be derived from those patients that had at least to plus expression. And so this is what in, in highlighted in green is what we now refer to today as being HER2 positive. In addition to that, when you look at the subgroup of patients that we actually call HER2 positive and you distinguish them as being IHC3 plus versus IHC2 plus, you can see that there's more profound uh, and pronounced improvement in outcomes with a median overall survival approaching a year and a half in the highest expressors compared to those tumors that have relatively lower expression, there's still some benefit, but it's, it's strikingly less. And this is a consistent finding that we've been seeing in every study that evaluates this going forward with HER2 positive disease. Now, this is relevant because the original approval from the FDA, we've talked about the differences between FDA approvals and NCCN guidelines in terms of what we uh, as a community of oncologists have agreed with, upon consensus, what is the right thing to do? They're, they're not always concordant. And this is an example of where the FDA approved the original eligibility criteria of the TOGA study. So patients technically that have IHC zero and one plus of HER2 are eligible for trastuzumab. But the NCCN guideline review was critical of that and saying, there's no benefit in that subgroup, and, and this has been repeatedly shown since. And so the decision, which I agree with, was to indicate that HER2 positivity does not include these patients, and therefore it's not recommended to give trastuzumab to these patients. And this will become very relevant. I'm going to show an exact figure, but with the PDL one story at the end of this presentation, after we go through all the data uh, from the various studies and show that it is the exact same phenomenon that has occurred. So the general outcomes with chemotherapy that were shown on the previous slide are summarized here in terms of what one might expect uh, in terms of response rate, disease control rate, progression-free survival median, and overall survival median with chemotherapy alone. But we do know that when we have a matched targeted therapy in the setting, especially when there's a matched positive biomarker, like now we're going to refer to um, anti-PD-1 therapies or PDL1 positive tumors. And as I mentioned, PDL1 positive tumors tend to track MSI high tumors and EBV positive tumors. So, in other words, these tumors are usually PDL1 positive. And some 
microsatellite stable tumors, MEBB negative tumors are also PDL1 positive. So PDL1 positivity sort of captures all of the important tumor types that should be getting immunotherapy. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about tumor mutation burden uh, in this presentation, other than, as I mentioned, it is directly related to MSI high tumors. They, they are usually TMB high, but there will also be high tumor mutation burden tumors that are not MSI high. And that, again, the relevance of that becomes more uh, important in later line therapies, which we'll save for later videos. Um, but even in the first line setting, which we're talking about here, if you have a high tumor mutation burden that's microsatellite stable, if it's going to derive benefit from immunotherapy, in my opinion, it's going to have high PDL1 expression also. And so by doing PDL1 testing, you will capture the most important subgroups within that. In previous uh, videos, we talked about how we get samples, how the pathologist processes them, how they get a diagnosis and tell us if, if there's cancer in the biopsy or surgical specimen. But importantly, we talked about routine biomarkers that are to be performed and relevant to this presentation, uh, immunostochemistry for PDL1 and also for the mismatch repair proteins to identify microsatellite instability um, in, indirectly, as well as obtaining DNA, doing next generation sequencing and getting microsatellite instability uh, result and mutation burden results um, can be done simultaneously so that you're capturing uh, as much information as possible to identify biomarkers that could predict benefit from immunotherapy drugs. PDL1 testing as a refresher um, looks at cancer cell expression as well as infiltrating immune cells and looking at the aggregate of both of those as a combined positivity score, which is the better test to predict benefit. Some tumors don't have a lot of tumor positivity, so the TPS score can be zero, but they have a lot of infiltrating immune cells that are PDL1 positive. MSI high tumors are a classic example of that, that often are, are positive by CPS, but can be negative by TPS. And so those are the tumors that respond the best. So if you don't do CPS scoring, you would miss that. And that's been shown over and over again, that CPS scoring is the best uh, predictive uh, biomarker for PDL1, PD1 inhibitors. Mismatch repair immunostochemistry we reviewed in that video. And you can see here that you can test for the four main mismatch repair proteins. And if it's absent, then that would be consistent with deficient mismatch repair, which as I talked about in that presentation, is a direct consequence then of getting microsatellite instability. So deficient mismatch repair tumors have microsatellite instability. And we know that this is a predictive biomarker to PD-1 therapies, as I'm going to show you in a moment. The next generation sequencing panels get the DNA and they look at all four of the types of genetic alterations that can occur. And they also sequence microsatellite regions and they can get um, microsatellite instability information and they can determine if the tumor has a high mutation burden. And so on this long list of panel of different genes that are being looked at, um, from doing the sequencing of all that DNA, they can assess whether or not there is a high mutation burden, like in this example shown here, has a high mutation burden, and also determine whether or not there's microsatellite instability. So what is the evidence then for anti-PD-1 therapy and first-line gastroesophageal cancer? And so I'm going to focus first on microsatellite instability high because that is the subgroup of this cancer that is the most sensitive and should definitely get immunotherapy as soon as first-line therapy, as I'll show you. But also we'll talk about where else and, and should it be in all comers, the rest of the patients should be able to get it, or is there a specific PDL one score that best predicts who benefits? And I'll show you the evidence of that. So first, MSI high. I, I talked about this particular study when we went in the video on clinical trials because this study was uh, really important in that it was the first unprecedented approval of a drug, pembrolizumab PD-1 therapy, Keytruda, for any tumor type, any solid tumor type that had microsatellite instability. That was against the conventional norm of how approvals would usually be for one drug in one tumor type and with one biomarker. 
And so now it was for any tumor type, as long as you had that biomarker, which was unconventional. And so this study looked at a relatively small number of patients, not randomized, um, of different tumor types that had all failed prior therapies. And so they were in second, third, fourth line or higher, um, and they got pembrolizumab as a, as a monotherapy without randomization. And amongst those patients, um, there were gastroesophageal cancer patients. So you can see in this pie chart, all the different types of cancers, and you can see that gastroesophageal cancer was one of them. Um, remember that I mentioned that in the stage four setting, MSI high tumors account for about two to 3% of, of gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas. In earlier disease, stage one, two, and three, it can be higher, and the TCGA was high as 23%. Most agree that that's an overestimate, and in most study sample sets, it's around seven or 8% incidence. Regardless, you can see that the response rate in this waterfall plot, most of the patients had shrinkage of their cancer, many of them having complete responses. And then with longer follow-up, you can see that even more patients were having deeper responses. So it takes some time to get to the best response. And this was really unprecedented, this response rate in patients who had all failed prior therapies standard for each of those tumor types, including gastroesophageal cancer. You can see that a number of them responded, all of these with uh, complete responses, some didn't, but the response rate was 60%. And overall, the response rate was really high. And so remember, first-line therapy with full Fox chemotherapy is around 40%. And so this was in later line after failing a lot of therapies where the response rate expected with any treatments, five to 10%, and this was unprecedented. And so in addition to that, the responses were durable and patients had really long um, progression-free survival and overall survival. A common question is, how long should I stay on an immunotherapy drug if it's working well? And you can see in, in this figure here that patients generally in these studies um, are required to come off treatment after at least two years. Some, some studies are written as, as 12 months, one year. But this study you can see is at two years that patients came off, off therapy and that's the little red triangles. And so that was because they re reached the two year mark. And you can see that they're still doing really well afterwards. And this was the, what was observed is that patients had excellent responses and that after stopping therapy, they behaved as if there was no more cancer present. And you can see that in the survival and progression-free survival curves that normally in the stage four setting, even if a drug is working, it, it makes the curve go more to the right, but eventually it, it always drops. Uh, but here we're seeing this so-called plateau or tail of the curve, where this looks like a, a locally advanced study in the stage two and three setting where some patients look like they're cured of their cancer. And so this was uh, phenomenal, outstanding, and exciting that these immunotherapy drugs could do this um, in this subgroup of patients that were MSI high. And so uh, we talked about in the clinical trials video that this led to an unprecedented approval uh, by the FDA for any solid tumor in later line setting, second line or higher, um, it, for pembrolizumab as long as patients had MSI high tumors, so including gastric and esophageal cancer. And again, this was without a randomized study. This was with a relatively small sample set. And it was an example of where, I, in my opinion, an accelerated approval definitely was warranted. And um, in many other places in the world, this was not the case. And so many patients, unfortunately, with an MSI high tumor didn't have access to this therapy. But in the United States, as of 2017, this was the case. Uh, in addition to support that the, this um, decision, later studies continued to show that MSI high tumors were really ultra sensitive to checkpoint inhibitors. And so we're gonna talk about a number of clinical trials um, and you'll note that all of our clinical trials have names and that's because it's helpful for us to refer to a study and everyone knows which study we're talking about. So um, these are three studies, Keynote 59, 61, and 62 um, in the third line setting, the second line setting, and in the first line setting. And you can see we're going to get to what happened in all the patients enrolled, the intention to treat all patients, any irrespective of pdl one score or irrespective of MSI high status. But 
for the purposes of just uh, closing the argument on MSI high, we see that patients that are MSI high, about two to three percent of each of these studies, you can see that the outcomes are outstanding. And so in this Keno 59 study, one of the first studies done in gastric and esophageal cancer is that in the third line setting, patients were given pembrolizumab at monotherapy and there was no randomized control. So there's, there's only one group of patients and they're all getting pembrolizumab. But when you compare those that have MSI high versus those that are the rest of the patients, you can see the stark differences. Similarly, in the second line study, which was a study looking at second line pembrolizumab monotherapy compared to second line paclitaxel. When we get to the second line videos, we will learn that paclitaxel and remucirumab is a standard of care because it was better than paclitaxel. But this study used paclitaxel as a control arm uh, because um, it was around the time of the approval of, of that uh, remucirumab. But more importantly, the rest of the world didn't have that approval. And so it reflected more globally of what the standard of care was. And so uh, this study allowed for all comers, irrespective of PDL1. But what's shown here are just the patients that had a PDL1 score of at least one. And you see that um, some patients do well, but some patients don't do well. And we'll get to that in the later slides. But when you look at the MSI high subgroup, it's outstanding compared to the control arm. And then finally, in the Keynote 62 study, um, which uh, was a first line study only for patients that had PDL1 score of one or higher. And again, you see this sort of mixed results, some doing okay, some not doing well with it. But with the MSI high tumors, it was outstanding. The MSI high tumors doing clearly better than patients that don't get uh, pembrolizumab. The pembrolizumab patients are doing better. So this was all evidence supporting the original approval for pembrolizumab for MSI tumors that of any solid tumor type, including gastroesophageal cancer. I mentioned earlier that MSI high tumors are usually PDL1 positive, and that is shown here um, in this study um, that was looking across those three studies I just mentioned: Keynote 59, third line study, Keynote 61, second line study, and Keynote 62, first line study. And you can see that the PDL1 scores. Um, uh, at the cutoff of one or higher, almost all the patients or all the patients are at least one or higher. And for a score of above 10, which as we get go through this talk, you're going to hear from me that I think that this is the optimal cutoff. Most of those patients are also above 10. And so in other words, the patients that are MSI high that are doing so well with these checkpoint inhibitors are also PDL1 positive. And so you will capture them by checking PDL1 scores. Another uh, important question now, as we now focus on first-line therapy, uh, the, the topic of this discussion, is the Keynote 62 study, which was the study looking in the first-line setting, was a, a three-arm study looking at chemotherapy control arm with placebo, chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab monotherapy. And so a question is, for MSI high tumors, since they do so well with the immunotherapy, is the chemotherapy necessary or can we just do pembrolizumab? And so on the right here, you see the outcomes of overall survival and progression-free survival in that Keynote 62 study for MSI high tumors. And you can see that the chemotherapy alone arm in light blue in the top curve and in purple in the bottom curve does the worst. So getting immunotherapy in the other two arms is better, but which one of those two is better with chemo or pembrolizumab alone? And you can see by survival, they look similar. And so why have more chemo if you can get the same outcome with pembrolizumab? The, the challenge with this is that there's relatively few patients here to, so as a non-inferiority look as pembrolizumab, is it okay to do without chemo? It's, it's suggestive, but it was certainly not definitive evidence. And in addition to that, when you look at the progression-free survival curves, you see that the pembrolizumab plus chemo in orange seems to be doing best. Yes, pembrolizumab is better than chemotherapy alone in, light, in the green curve here compared to chemotherapy alone, but it's really plus chemotherapy that seems to do better. Some other um, retrospective analyses of other cohorts seems to su support this. Um, and so for now, I think the standard option would be to give chemotherapy plus uh, pembrolizumab even for or nivolumab, as we'll get to 
even in the first line setting, even for MSI high tumors. So what about non-MSI high tumors, the vast majority of cases, the microsatellite stable tumors? So um, this is a map of all the studies that have been done or are completed or ongoing um, for gastroesophageal cancer. Um, the top row are those that have been completed and reported, and the, the bottom row are those that are ongoing. Some have some preliminary reports, but um, are still ongoing for their primary endpoints. And by column is first line, second line, third line. Over here is a legend. Um, just to highlight here that there are a lot of checkpoint inhibitors available now from various companies and uh, from pembrolizumab and nivolumab, the first two, but then there are others and we're going to go through some of the evidence and data for them. And whenever you see a keynote study, it's referring to pembrolizumab, et cetera, and you can read through this. And so um, the way I think about this is briefly, we, we think about the original studies that were conducted. And those were conducted with pembrolizumab or nivolumab or other checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy, not in combination with anything else, just that therapy and in the various lines of setting, as you can see. Um, so most of the second line and third line studies, if not all of them, were just monotherapy, not in combination with chemo. Um, the first line studies are mostly in combination with chemotherapy except for Keynote 62, which I just showed you has three arms. One has just pembrolizumab alone, and one has chemo plus pembrolizumab. And I'll also point out that Checkmate 649 study later, that was also a three-arm study of chemo with or without nivolumab, and then a third arm of a chemo-free regimen um, with nivolumab plus a CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, and we'll get to that. And so when I talk about the results of these studies, I sort of show uh, what we learned from the monotherapy studies and then what we learned in the first line setting, which is now the most relevant uh, with chemotherapy. Um, it is a, an important point to note, though, is that with any new investigational agent, um, it's very often that they start in later line studies uh, to, to get in and to see if there's efficacy, to see if there's activity. And if those studies are looking positive, then they move into earlier lines and eventually the first line. And if shown beneficial in first line, then they move into curative intense setting. Now that's not always true. Like we talked about trastuzumab for her two positive disease, and that was initially studied in the first line setting. And, and that's where um, it, it resides as a standard of care. And similarly, we're going to talk about zolbituximab, a clotting inhibitor, and that was studied first as a phase three study in the first line setting. So it doesn't always happen that they start in later lines, but in the story of checkpoint inhibitors, they did. And they started in the third line setting or higher uh, with Keynote 59, um, and then others followed suit. So what did we learn um, from the monotherapy studies? Uh, there are a lot of studies, but I can summarize them here in this slide. And what we learned was that there are certain biomarkers and clinical features that we can predict who will do well with immunotherapy drugs and who should not be getting immunotherapy drugs, at least as a monotherapy. And that is shown here. I showed you what the curves looked like. They, almost every one of the studies in monotherapy that had a control arm of chemotherapy looks like this, which I refer to as a yin-yang curve, where there, there's crossing of the curves and the pembrolizumab arm in, in green compared to the, uh, or, or any checkpoint inhibitor arm in green, compared to the chemotherapy arm in purple, you can see that some cases, the chemotherapy seems to do better. And in other cases, other patients, the, the immunotherapy does better. And when you parse it out, there are certain features like low PDL1, negative PDL1, poor performance status, weakness, frailty, um, adenocarcinoma is worse than squamous cell tumors or high volume of disease, lots of cancer burden in the body are all things that would predict lack of benefit of the immunotherapy. And you can see here, this is the Keynote 61 study, second line study. One of the few studies that actually shows the outcome specifically only in the low PDL1 tumors. And you can see that pembrolizumab in green 
does worse than standard or substandard chemotherapy. I mentioned this is just paclitaxel. It's not even paclitaxel and remisirumab. It's just paclitaxel. And pembrolizumab is worse than that. And so other features like this all tend to predict that monotherapy immunotherapy is not the way to go. Standard therapy is the way to go. On the other hand, there are certain subgroups, like I pointed out, MSI high and others. We're going to get to high PDL1 and show you that, but certainly high PDL1 and certainly the highest cutoff is the best CPS 10 or higher. It tends to predict benefits. So those patients that are getting uh, immunotherapy in this subgroup do way better than patients who are getting just chemotherapy. And so the problem is, is that if you give all patients these drugs, you get this type of a curve and it looks like maybe there's not much benefit. So that's what we learned from later line monotherapy studies and even in the first line keynote 62 study. So what did we then learn in the first line studies, which becomes the most relevant question because this is where now it's, uh, it's used and approved and it's based on this list of studies uh, indicated here. And this list continues to grow. I'm going to run out of room here soon if, if more studies are, are read out and have to keep adding them. But uh, you can see again, the, the study names and their related uh, checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and so I mentioned the Keynote 62 study, which was the first first line study. It was a three arm study um, looking at chemo with or without pembrolizumab with a placebo control, and then the third arm of just pembrolizumab alone. And the Checkmate 6049 study is the only other three arm study, which was looking at chemo with or without nivolumab and a third arm of nivolumab and ipilimumab. And we're going to look at the results of that study. And so what you see here is that while there are some nuanced differences of each of these studies, uh, not only is there a different checkpoint inhibitor, in my mind, those checkpoint inhibitors are relatively interchangeable and very, very similar to each other. But more, more importantly, any differences in outcome can be attributed to just random variation, size of the studies, as I'm going to show you, eligibility criteria. So I'll point out here that most of these studies are gastric cancer and GE junction. However, the Checkmate 649 study is, is unique in that it allowed also esophageal adenocarcinomas. And the Keynote 590 study did not allow for gastric cancer. And that's going to come up in a moment. And in addition to that, most of these studies, especially the later ones, allowed any patient uh, um, to be eligible irrespective of PDL1 status. However, the Keynote 62 study was only for a CPS one or higher, and the Checkmate 649 study allowed all comers, but the primary endpoint, as I'll show you, was for patients that had a CPS five or higher. And so finally, the results of these studies, as you can see here, um, red uh, denoting negative, green denoting positive, is that some of these studies are considered overall negative. And some of the remainder of the studies, most of them are considered overall positive and green. However, there are some subgroups in Keynote 62, I just showed you, for example, that have significant benefit, like MSI high tumors, high PDL1 tumors potentially. And uh, there are patient subgroups in each of these positive studies that do not drive benefit, namely those that have low levels or negative levels of PDL1. And I will show you that. And so overall, even though all these studies are different, they have some nuanced differences in eligibility uh, by, by PDL1 status, by histology, by tumor location, and there's heterogeneity in the outcomes. Overall, the findings are very consistent with each other. And I want to re help to relay that and have you understand that by the end of this presentation. What we learned is summarized he here. And really that is that squamous cell tumors tend to be more sensitive than adenocarcinomas, all else equal. Microsatellite instability high tumors have a much uh, higher sensitivity to checkpoint inhibitors compared to microsatellite stable. The higher the level of pdl one the better. It seems that Asian patients do better than the rest of the world uh, for unclear reasons, whether it's because they have higher amounts of each of these in e e all of the studies, or some other un unknown reason. Regardless, it's a common thing that is seen in forest plots, as I'll show you. 
So we're going to take each one of these one by one uh, just briefly. And the first one is the Keynote 62 study. And this is the only one, remember, that's looking at pembrolizumab monotherapy compared to chemotherapy as one of the comparisons in that three-arm study. And that's shown here. And what we see is, remember, this study was only for patients that had pdl one score of one or higher that had gastric cancer or G-junction adenocarcinoma. And what we saw was this yin-yang crossing of the curve. Some patients doing worse with immunotherapy, some patients doing better compared to chemotherapy. And in that subgroup analysis of PDL1 10 or higher, it seemed to help differentiate and, and capture those that, that are going to do better compared to chemotherapy, but there was still some patients that did worse with the immunotherapy compared to chemo. So not selected and well enough um, with PDL1 10 or high. Higher. And so overall, this was considered a negative result. But now more relevant to this talk is chemotherapy plus immunotherapy in the first line setting. And this was the first study, remember, that looked at this for gastric uh, cancer. And you can see here in orange, chemotherapy plus placebo, and in black, pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy. And you can see that the pembrol arm um, in either the subgroup of one or higher, all the patients enrolled, or in, in the subgroup of patients that are 10 or higher, there is this trend to benefit in both of these, but overall the study was considered negative because we talked about statistics and this was considered not statistically significant. The confidence interval of the hazard ratio crosses the boundary of one, and so it's not considered statistically significant. This was a relatively small study and that's gonna become important uh, as I show you over the next few slides. So the result of this study was um, that it was showing some benefit in some patients, but it wasn't considered positive overall, and it did not lead to approval for pembrolizumab and gastric cancer, which is an important uh, thing to know. The next big study was the parallel study of pembrolizumab called Keynote 590, which was looking at the rest of the gastroesophageal cancer patients, esophageal squamous cell, esophageal adenocarcinoma, and G-junction adenocarcinoma. So their G-junction adenocarcinomas were eligible for either Keynote 590 or for Keynote 62. And you can see that in overall, this study was considered positive, and it was exciting to see this in the first-line setting. Um, and when we look at the forest plot, we see a, a number of different things. I mentioned how Asian patients tend to do better than non-Asian patients, and that, that's a common thing we see in these forest plots. Um, we see that squamous cell tumors tend to do better than adenocarcinomas, and very importantly, we see that PDL1 high tumors by a cutoff of 10 do better than those that are less than 10. And to me, this was evidence that um, low PDL1 tumors just do not drive benefit from these therapies. The incidence of CPS 10 or higher is a matter of debate in this particular study. It amounts to around 50%, irrespective of histology, both in the squamous cell and the adenocarcinomas. In real world samples, um, you know, this incidence tends to be lower, uh, as low as 10%, usually on the order of 10 to 25% incidence. Uh, regardless why it's so high in this, um, this study, maybe one hypothesis is that there's um, pre selection. Um, patients are getting screened by their local physician with routine PDL1 assays, and only if it's positive would they then entertain enrolling into the study. And so it gets an inflated incidence of PDL1 because a lot of the negative tumors were never, never considered for this study. Um, so that's one major uh, possibility as to why this seems to be a higher incidence than what is actually seen in the real world. Regardless, the results of this study led to uh, the inclusion of pembrolizumab in the NCCN guidelines for patients with CPS 10 or higher um, for esophageal and GA junction, but again, not stomach cancer because that they were not eligible for this study. The Keynote 62 study was negative on the previous slide, and so that's uh, why it's not, it wasn't included and still isn't to date um, in gastric cancer. Um, you will see when we get to the NCCN guidelines and I show you, they will also list for CPS less than 10, but with less uh, at level, uh, category level. We talked about the NCCN guidelines, how we use categories for the strength and the robustness of the evidence. So this is a category one recommendation, and then there's category 
to be recommendations for less than 10. So it could be considered, but it's not um, as strongly uh, recommended. And some insurance companies look at 2B category and do not approve based on that. That's why this is important. Importantly, the FDA approved pembrolizumab irrespective of PDL1 all for all comers, irrespective of histology for esophageal and G junction adenocarcinoma. Somewhat confusingly, the European Medical Association, the, the equivalent of the FDA in Europe, approved for only PDL1 greater than 10. So there's a lot of heterogeneity even in the guidelines and approvals um, on fragmentation. And you can see uh, why this becomes quite complicated. But the reason why the NCCM guidelines gives it a lower recommendation, why the European Medical Agency didn't approve it at all for less than 10 is because there's really no difference. So I mentioned that Keynote 61, which was a second line study, is one of the few studies to show the survival curves outside of just in a forest plot um, for the low level PDL1 group. This is the only other study that is shown exclusively for just low level. Uh, PDL1 scores. And you can see there's no difference. There's no statistically significant difference, and there's just no visual difference. Um, and this is a, quite a large sample set. So, you know, when we get to the reason why we talk about this is because these drugs come with side effects and other issues. And so um, we don't want to give a therapy that we know doesn't work to somebody if we can avoid it. And that's an example. Moving to the next main study is the Checkmate 649 study. This was the first study done with nivolumab, Opdivo, in the first-line setting. And as I mentioned, this was also a three-arm study. And we're going to focus on the two main arms of the study, which was chemotherapy control, wasn't placebo controlled, uh, compared to chemotherapy plus nivolumab, so Folfox or Capox. Um, with with or without nivolumab. And the primary endpoint you can see was survival overall in progression three survival in the PDL1 CPS five or higher. Secondary endpoints were in one or higher, 10 or higher, um, or in all randomized patients. So um, you can see uh, that in these studies, especially these early studies, it was trying to be determined what is the optimal cutoff for PDL1 to call a patient's tumor PDL1 positive or negative. And so this was the outcome in that primary endpoint, just the PDL1 uh, five or higher group. And you can see that nivolumab clearly does better than patients that get only chemotherapy. And an absolute benefit of median overall survival of 3.3 months, that was statistically significant. So um, I wanna point out, this is the forest plot of this, this group of patients. And you can see again, to the left of this line, uh, the one line would be favoring nivolumab and to the right or would be favoring the control arm. And if it was straddling across this line, then it would be no difference between the two arms. And I want to point out that all of these subgroups tend to have benefit from nivolumab, but the MSI high tumors have this extraordinary benefit. And Normally, we would look at these things as potentially just outliers, random variation, it's small sample size. But the point is, is that in every study that looks at MSI high tumors, just because they're rare, uh, but they always have this outstanding benefit. So they are exquisitely sensitive to immunotherapies and they should get it right away in the first line setting. Uh, this is showing, again, the survival curves just by MSI high versus microsatellite stable in this study. And you can see that microsatellite stable looks like the general uh, outcome of the study, but the MSI high tumors do significantly better. Getting back again to that question about can we do just immunotherapy in MSI high tumors um, compared to immunotherapy plus chemo, the evidence, as I showed you, to date um, is not clear or definitive, but for now, I think that giving chemotherapy with the immunotherapy seems to be better uh, than just the immunotherapy alone, at least in a, as a generalization. There may be select cases that you might consider doing just immunotherapy alone. And we'll point out the third arm of this study with uh, Checkmate 649, looking at nivolumab and ipilimumab, showing um, some significant benefit in the MSI high tumors. 
So what about the patients with less than a score of five that were also enrolled to the study, but not the primary endpoint? Well, when we add the 168 patients that got nivolumab um, that were between one and five to the patients that 473 patients that had five or higher, we see that this curve uh, of patients that have PDL1 score of one or higher still shows benefit, but the magnitude of benefit, the absolute median survival benefit is now 2.7 instead of 3.3, and the hazard ratio has decreased. And then when we add the 148 patients that had PDL1 scores of zero to the remaining patients, you can see that yes, the curves still look better, but they're starting to become closer to each other. The median survival benefits decreased yet again. And so showing me that these patients are not doing as well and it's bringing the result down. And so this to me was again evidence like in the Keynote 590 study that showed that those tumors didn't seem to be doing much. And in fact, they were making the result look worse. Initially, we didn't see the results or outcomes of these PDL1 subgroups individually. They were always just added to the whole. So regardless, the NCCN guidelines, similar to the Keynote 590 study, listed Folfox with nivolumab for CPS scores of five or higher um, as category one evidence. And I'll show you later um, where it also includes less than five with category 2B. Um, and the, similar to the, what the approvals in the United States with the FDA compared to the approval in Europe is that the FDA approved for all comers, irrespective of PDL one um, and the EMA approved uh, only for CPS five or higher. So why uh, weren't these originally reported? Um, so uh, several months later, we saw the results in a forest plot and you can see that the patients that had CPS scores of less than one, which was a large number of patients, um, that the median survivals were not statistically significantly different. Similarly, for CPS less than five, the median survivals were not statistically significantly different. And so the same was true for progression-free survival, and the same was true for response rates. They were not statistically significantly different. About a year, year and a half later, we saw a presentation of the above or less than 10 uh, analysis. And you can see here that the patients less than 10 had no significant difference in their median overall survival. And this is like half of the patients enrolled in the study. Uh, and similarly, response rates were, were not uh, dramatically different. And so another question that arises is, what about the patients between five and and 10. And we haven't seen those specific outcomes of just those patients isolated, which is about 142 patients uh, enrolled into this study. But that may be as suggestive as to why we haven't seen that. Probably would have seen that if it was positive. And so for now, most of the evidence points to CPS 10 being the best cutoff to be the best predictive of who's going to drive benefit and who is not going to drive benefit. So I wanted to uh, focus now on that third arm briefly of Checkmate 649, which is again, the chemo-free arm of nivolumab plus ipilimumab as a, as a chemo-free approach uh, to these patients. And remember in the cancer immunity cycle that CTLA-4 antibody checkpoint inhibitors, checkpoints can be either at the level of the lymph node where uh, T cells are being primed and activated or at the level peripherally at the cancer. CTLA-4 antibodies can work here and peripherally, but for the most part, they're working centrally and they're sort of a reciprocal relationship to PD-1 uh, inhibitors, which are the reverse. So um, this is where we're really talking that this, this checkpoint is active. And remember in this, you can see that antigen presenting cells, we talked about dendritic cells that help to train and select for uh, inactive T cells that can bind to cancer antigens through this lock and key major histocompatibility complex uh, a class two with uh, T cell receptors um, and sort of activate uh, and prime T cells. However, there's a checkpoint here so that this doesn't become overactive. And that is with CTLA-4 on the T cells. And so this will is an inhibitory signal that, that overcomes this and keeps this T cell inactive. These CTLA-4 antibodies bind to CTLA-4 block this interaction and so then allow 
uh, the proliferation and selection of these specific T cells. So by giving um, an anti-CTLA-4 antibody like ipilimumab, and there's others like it, then this will help to stimulate this process. So what happened in this arm of the study um, in the patients who were either pdl one five or higher or all the patients enrolled? And you can see here that in this um, arm, we're seeing in this chemo-free approach versus a chemo control that we are seeing this yin-yang crossing of the curves phenomenon again, where some patients seem to be doing better with nevo ipi compared to chemo, but there's some patients that did worse. And so um, certainly more pronounced in all the patients compared to the patients who had at least some pdl one positivity, where, where you see more patients doing worse um, in the all randomized group um, compared to control. So this arm uh, with these results was considered negative and did not lead to any approval of ipilimumab. But then you can also see here in the progression-free survival analysis, that is the, the time that the cancer is controlled for, is that it's significantly worse compared to the chemotherapy alone. And that again is what we've seen um, across the board in, in chemo-free approaches with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, I pointed out also in the uh, margituximab story with a PD-1 inhibitor um, ready family map in the HER2 positive video, where this type of thing was not observed, where this dramatic drop in survival and progression and progression free survival was not observed in that chemo free approach, and so uh, suggests that double targeting um, in that situation seems to have more promise, uh, but when we look at the MSI high, high group in the Checkmate 649 study, getting nivolumab and ipilimumab chemo-free, you can see that these patients are doing exceptionally well compared to chemo alone. And as opposed to the microsatellite stable, the rest of the majority of the patients where you see this crossing. And so in the right patient, it might be um, something of interest. Uh, we've been talking about is pembrolizumab alone versus pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy the right thing to do for MSI high tumors? But what about adding a CTLA-4 inhibitor plus a PD-1 inhibitor? Can that uh, optimize therapy but limit the side effects of chemotherapy? I think that merits uh, more patients, more evaluation, because remember, these are just small numbers, subsets. And to really determine non-inferiority to say chemo plus immunotherapy I, I would like to see a little bit more evidence before omitting chemotherapy, because what we want to prevent is a uh, dropping of, of these curves in, in patients that are getting chemo-free approaches. I'm going to talk now quickly about some of the other first-line studies. Uh, this was yet another nivolumab first-line study, but of the attraction line, the attraction studies are mostly Asian uh, country, uh, countries enrolling to the attraction studies as opposed to the checkmate studies, which are more global, including the United States and Western Europe. And so the attraction four study was another first-line study with nivolumab, but this study paradoxically was negative for survival. As you can see here, there's no difference in their survivals. And um, one thing to note though, is that it's not been reported in terms of the PDL1 subgroups. And so it may be, as I'll show you in a summary slide in a moment, that they just may have enrolled by chance more patients with lower PDL1 scores. And that explains why the outcome overall seems to be not as good. But if we were to look at just the high PDL1s, maybe there's still benefit there. It would be paradoxical if that was not the case and would be something not be easily explained. Another study that read out with uh, the Orient 16 study with yet a different PD-1 inhibitor called Scintillamab shows clear benefit um, by adding Scintillamab to chemo in first line compared to placebo, certainly in the PDL one greater than five with an absolute improvement in median survival of 5.5. Is that really different than the Checkmate 649, which was 3.3 months absolute? I think this is an example, if we go back and look at the clinical trials video, and statistics, this is just random variation, random patient selection. I don't think that scintillamab is as better than nivolumab. I think that these are just different studies and that overall, uh, this is all hovering around the same benefit. And this one just seems to be slightly larger just by random chance. 
Uh, but we also see a very similar phenomenon is that when you include patients that have a CPS of less than five um, to the patients that have more than five, that this benefit is diluted. It's still there, but it's diluted. And as are the hazard ratios, um, also diluted, getting closer to one. So, so what is the benefit in just those patients that are less than five or in zero? And so that's shown here in this forest plot where you can see that the hazard ratio is really remarkable in the really high PDL1 group. And then it starts to decrease um, as you add more patients with lower PDL1 tumors, but we don't see explicitly what happens in the lowest level um, expressors, just them alone without the others dragging the curves into improvement. And so in this table, you see that the patients that are either less than 10 or less than five or less than one, that their differences are basically non-existent. There are no differences and their hazard ratios are not statistically significant. All of the benefit is really being driven by the patients above 10. So what we just talked about with those studies, Orient 16, Checkmate 649, Keynote 62, Metraction 4, and remember their rel relative drugs, is that overall, their outcomes are, are, are relatively similar, but they have different conclusions of their primary endpoint. Two of these studies are considered positive and two of these studies are considered negative, but there are negative elements um, in the positive studies, namely the patients with low pd one and there are positive elements in the negative studies, those patients that have high pd one and MSI high, et cetera. And so overall, though, when you look at the survival of medians, the absolute differences are all around the same, you know, between half a month to three months. And so depending on the nuances of the study, depending on this random patient selection, this is what you would see. They're not dramatically different, even though some are considered positive and some are considered negative. Um, one uh, point uh, specifically for this attraction four study is an explanation why the survival might not be much different is that more patients got later line immunotherapy and second line or higher. And so what that means is maybe that dilutes out the effect of the first line therapy. In, in other words, if patients in the control arm in the first line setting don't get immunotherapy, but then they do later, then they're going to do well. And so any survival benefit that would have been seen in the first line is, is not there. So that argument is potentially uh, contributing to why this study is negative. But I would argue an even more uh, important component is the makeup within the studies of high versus low PDL1 tumors. So you can see here, for example, that the, the two positive studies have a relatively high incidence of CPS 10 or higher, almost 50%. Whereas in the Keynote 62 study, it's lower. And in fact, it's even lower than that because these two studies are looking at the incidence amongst all comers. And this study is looking at just amongst the patients who are PDL1 score of one or higher. And so if you look at all the patients screened in that study, it made up only 15% of all the patients screened. And so there's a dramatic difference here. And that alone could explain why uh, we're not seeing the, the positivity in this study compared to these others. And as I pointed out, we don't even know what the incidences are of the pdl one expression in the attraction four study. It may be that they have really low incidences of pdl one high tumors. And so that can explain why their survivals aren't uh, as good as in some of these other studies. And another reason is potentially the size of these studies, um, where you see the Checkmate 649 is a massive study in terms of the numbers of patients enrolled compared to, say, Keynote 62, which is basically a third the size. Um, and so remember, in the Principles of Clinical Trials video, we talked about how uh, the numbers of patients in a study can help to eliminate false positives, and they can also help to eliminate false negatives. And so this is an example I'm going to show you um, that with more patients, we can uh, detect a smaller benefit and therefore limit uh, what would be considered a false negative. And so that's shown here, where in Keynote 62, the comparison of Pembro and chemo versus chemo alone, which I mentioned, was showing a trend to benefit, but was considered negative. Um, it had a 507 patients randomized. In, we're looking at the hazard ratio where we remember the lower the number, the larger the magnitude of benefit. And in this case, it was crossing one and so not statistically significant. 
Um, and so the absolute benefit though in median overall survival was 1.4 months. When we compare that to the Checkmate 649 study, uh, the direct comparison of CPS greater than one, the hazard ratio here was a little bit better, 0.77, but there was like almost three times as many patients enrolled. So it would be a more accurate and precise estimate of the differences between checkpoint inhibitor and chemo versus chemo alone. And in the all randomized subgroup, which was really large sample set, again, it, it can find relatively low absolute benefits of 2.2 months, for example, and be considered statistically significant with their p-values. So what was done? Well, a follow-up study, or second chance, if you will, uh, called Keynote 859 study was done that was substantially larger. And a press release recently um, showed that this study was positive with a hazard ratio of 0.7. Uh, eight, so right in the range of these uh, studies from Checkmate 649. So with a lot of patients, they eliminated a false negative, so to speak, uh, of Keynote 62. And that data was recently reported um, uh, in earlier this year. And you can see that the, the survival curves look very similar to even Keynote 62, but certainly to Checkmate 649. And the absolute benefit is 1.4 months, but now this time it's statistically significant because we've got more patients looking at the same question. And so what's important to note though, is that the same phenomenon is observed in that if you look closely at these forest plots and you look at the hazard ratios, the benefit is driven by the patients that have high PDL1 scores compared to those that have low PDL1 scores. And importantly, it's not really yet been reported of what the outcomes were for patients between one and 10, which is almost half of the patient. And so the results of the Keynote 859 study, Checkmate 649 study, and the Keynote 62 study is very instructive when you're trying to understand clinical trials, designs, and statistics, and that the same difference can be considered negative or positive depending on these types of factors. So if we map now the outcome of a checkpoint inhibitor study with chemo versus chemo alone, and we've, I've used the actual numbers of the Checkmate 649 study and superimpose that on the figure comparing to chemotherapy alone. This is the outcome of the Checkmate 649 study of the control arm of chemotherapy alone, median survival, and then the addition of the volume. But now I'm gonna show you a phenomenon that's very reminiscent to the trastuzumab HER2 positive story. And that is when you look at subgroups by the biomarker PDL1, you see that the outcomes are really driven by higher levels of PDL1. This is looking at the cutoff of five. And you can see that below five, there's no real difference with nivolumab compared to chemotherapy alone. Um, whereas all of the difference is more pronounced now in the PDL1 greater than five. And similarly, the cutoff of 10 is really where it's at. And that's where the biggest difference, where the, the difference between the control arm and then the volumab arm lies. The less than 10, there's no difference. In fact, the median survival is a little bit worse um, when you plot the actual median overall survival. So this is what, in my opinion, should be the cutoff, the optimal cutoff of identifying who is most likely to derive benefit from these therapies. And with a median now overall survival of 14.4 months, um, substantially better than what was expected uh, with chemotherapy alone in this subgroup. So there's a lot of discussion um, and controversy about PDL1 testing. We went through this um, in the molecular biomarker uh, videos, particularly on assay performance subset, uh, the third video of the um, biomarker uh, testing. And there are two main antibodies available in the United States uh, for pathologists to assess for uh, PDL1 status. Uh, the 22C3 diagnostic antibody, which is linked to uh, Merck and the uh, pembrolizumab, Keytruda drug, and then the 288 antibody diagnostic that is linked with uh, BMS and the volumab of Devo. And so, uh, studies have been done looking at the concordance of the same sample 
stained with these two different antibodies uh, to see how concordant or not they are. This is one study listed here. This is another study listed here. Most studies show that they're relatively concordant with these two antibodies and even other antibodies that are available with PD-L1. But some studies, their final conclusion is that they're not uh, that concordant. But I've argued uh, that in where it matters, like above 10, is where there's really not a lot of dispute amongst um, these antibodies, even in uh, studies that have concluded that there's not uh, much concordance. So again, this study, which uh, yet another one read out that suggested that there's not a lot of concordance, but then when you look at the important cutoffs above 10 or even above 20, there's a really tight concordance. And that that's, in my opinion, where it matters most. If you have to squint to see it, some people are going to think they see it, some people aren't. But overall, in my opinion, it, the conclusion should be it's negative anyway, and it doesn't matter, as I've shown you from the evidence and the forest plots and the curves. Um, more, more importantly is uh, many of these studies um, have assessed whether the pathologists have taken some training to be able to score these uh, tests, and a lot of them don't. And so um, one study looked at um, assessment before and after training and show that after training, it is really uh, well concordant uh, between pathologists um, for uh, scoring CPS scores, especially above 10. And so training the pathologist and, and assessing competency uh, is really important. And, and further support is that when the scoring is done centrally in studies, as it has always been in all the studies I've just shown you, it always shows a predictive value. And so it is a good biomarker test as long as the scorer, the person doing the scoring is trained and competent to do it. Uh, and so the same is true with HER2, as I showed you in those videos, in that you know there's a lot of discordance between local pathologists and central pathologists, but the answer hasn't been, well, let's just give everyone uh, the therapy just in case it was to train the pathologists and make sure that you're getting your testing done at a high volume experienced center, like you would with surgery, like you would with pathology, like you would with a medical oncologist. Why do I make such a point of this? Is that immunotherapy, not only is it expensive, but more importantly, it causes side effects. And you can see here all the list of potential side effects from immunotherapy across the various organ systems in our body. And that's because some of our normal cells express PDL1 as a mechanism to defend itself from our own immune system to avoid autoimmunity. And so if we're releasing the brakes on our own tissues, then our immune system can attack our own tissues. And so common organ systems are endocrine glands, like our thyroid gland, where it's very common that you get hypothyroidism, low thyroid function, where you now have to take replacement hormone with synthroid and levothyroxine. Um, and, and in addition, the GI tract with the diarrhea, nausea, skin issues, dermatitis, itchiness, redness can be severe. Uh, muscle and bones, joint aches, muscle aches, um, myositis, inflammation. Um, any anything here with an itis on each of these words means inflammation, immune response in that area, um, and then also just systemic issues. They feeling tired and fatigued all the time can be a consequence of immunotherapy toxicity. So, of course, we always weigh the risks and benefits that could potentially occur with any therapy, and and in the setting of where the potential benefits far outweigh potential risks then there, that's one thing. But if the potential benefits are non-existent, as I've been showing you, then why would you take added risk of getting any or all of these things? And when I show you this table, these are the side effects that can be seen uh, treatment-related adverse events. This is from the Checkmate 649 study, but it's very similar across all of these immunotherapy studies in that, again, in clinical trials, we grade side effects on a scale of one to four, four being most severe, one being least severe. And um, you can see that the grade three, four side effect profile is 15% higher in the nivolumab arm compared to the chemotherapy arm without nivolumab. And so 
a lot of patients will experience immune related side effects. And so again, we would only want to take that risk if we knew that you were in the group that would have some chance of deriving benefit from these therapies. Um, a lot of serious uh, side effects, 7% uh, more having serious treat, uh, treatment related side effects. A lot of patients stopping their therapy, all of their therapy, even the active chemotherapy because of these side effects. And so these are all reasons why we want to be judicious in terms of who gets these therapies is because we don't want to negatively affect outcomes. Um, these are the list of common uh, treatment-related side effects that are immune-related in our organs, endocrine, uh, gastrointestinal, uh, and liver, pulmonary, inflammation in the lungs, shortness of breath, kidney dysfunction, and skin dermatitis. And so, again, the point here is to emphasize that these drugs do come with a side effect profile. And although overall by themselves as monotherapy are considered well tolerated, especially when directly compared to side effects of chemo, if we knew that it wasn't adding any benefit, why would we add side effect profile? That makes no sense. So um, uh, the summary here of this NCCN guidelines on the left is esophagus and G junction, and on the right is the stomach. Again, we're looking here now at HER2 negative tumors, and um, it's a little bit more easy to read of the stomach, so we'll start there. You can see that the category one recommendation for stomach cancer for PDL1 above five of nivolumab oxaliplatin and fluoropyrimidine. However, under certain circumstances, one might consider for HER2 negative tumors the same, but for PDL1 less than five, category 2B. And so this is, of course, based on the results of the Checkmate 649. Remember, the studies with pembrolizumab did not include stomach cancer for uh, Keynote 590, which was a positive study. And the stomach cancer study, Keynote 62, was negative, so it did not gain approval. Now, we do expect, based on the Keynote 859 study, that pembrolizumab will be added here. It's just a matter of time. When that study is uh, approved by the FDA, then, then it will be listed here in the NCCN guidelines. On the other side, in the esophagus and adenocarcinoma G junction, it's a little bit confusing. And, and you can see here that for HER2 negative tumors, that all of Checkmate 649 is listed in one line here. And that category one for CPS above five, category 2B for CPS less than five, which is the same as these two things. However, because there's also the Keynote 590 data with pembrolizumab, which was positive, we see that it's category one for CPS greater than 10, category 2B for CPS less than 10, using cisplatin, pembrolizumab, and an efloropyrimidine. And then another layer of category 2A, so less robust recommendation for CPS above 10 with oxaliplatin, which again is preferred. And then a 2B also for less than 10 with oxaliplatin. And then in here is, uh, you know, uh, immunotherapy-free chemotherapy with uh, fluoropyrimidine and platinum. So my opinions now, as you can probably deduce based on how I've been presenting, is that patients that have a pdl one score CPS less than five is not recommended to receive uh, first-line anti-PD-1 therapy, in my opinion. The other obvious extreme is that patients that have above 10 uh, should receive chemotherapy with a checkpoint inhibitor, the two that are currently approved are nivolumab or pembrolizumab for uh, G-junction and esophagus and nivolumab for stomach, pembrolizumab shortly to follow, and probably a number of others to follow in, in the future. It's in the middle here between five and nine that, again, there's no evidence that it really works well there. There's never been a, a report of just those group to show us that there's benefit or not. Um, but you know, I put it here in yellow that it could be considered to use a checkpoint inhibitor here, but only if there's not another good biomarker. And that's a good segue to the next presentation where we're going to be talking about Claudin 18.2, where that's a positive study based on a different biomarker. And we'll be talking about in the triple negative, HER2 negative, PDL1 negative, Claudin 18.2 negative video, that uh, there may be other better options in the future of emerging biomarkers or even already established biomarkers that are not necessarily approved. 
And so in this uh, setting, the concept is prioritize the patient's tumor profile and give them their best option. And so uh, that's how I would describe this uh, currently with this PDL1 stratifications. Again, as a final thing to say is that MSI high tumors and EBV positive tumors, and to some degree T TMB high, we don't necessarily have to check for each of these in the first line setting because there's redundancy in that most of these patients have high PDL1 tumors. In the setting of a patient that has an MSI high tumor, but it's not PDL1 high, especially if it's like between five to nine, that might be the setting uh, where first line anti PD1 therapy should still be used. So uh, in this video, we went through the immunotherapy uh, treatment in the first line setting, specifically in the HER2 negative PDL1 positive subgroup. And in the following uh, two videos, we'll be focusing on clotin positive tumors and in the tumors who are triple negative for the other three biomarkers. So in this video, I went through all of the data of first line and later line um, evidence for using anti-PD-1 therapies, namely nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are the currently two approved therapies for gastroesophageal adenocarcinoma, um, with focus now and most relevant to first-line therapy. We talked about um, the subgroup analyses, particularly really highly sensitive tumors like MSI high tumors. Higher PDL one scores tend to predict who will be the most likely to drive benefit. Not all patients that have high PDL one tumors will drive benefit, but if there is going to be benefit, they tend to lie in the high PDL one scoring. And we showed evidence that those with less than 10 really do not drive much benefit. There may be some select cases where, uh, you know, one would consider that particularly say if there's no other uh, biomarker positive and there's equivocally high, like between five to nine, one might consider doing that. But I should say that those patients and all patients should always consider a clinical trial as the best option to try uh, and get access to newer therapies that may even be better. And I will finally say that in this particular video, as in all of them, my opinions are my opinions, and, and sometimes there's not consensus on this, um, but especially in the setting of immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors and with PDL one there is uh, debate and there's not 100% uh, consensus on this, and I've, I've portrayed it uh, from my perspective and, and using my rationale to, to describe that to you. So stay tuned for the next video, uh, first line therapy for HER2 negative, PDL1 negative, clotin positive tumors. Thank you.